and welcome to the 2020 Geneva Motor Show, which, as you all know, has been cancelled. So it's coming at you from a studio in southwest London rather than Geneva. Now, on the plus side, and that means that baguettes do not cost 10 quid. And nobody will walk in front of me when I am trying to talk to you. So here are the cars you must see from the 2020 Geneva Motor Show. Geneva traditionally kicks off with the announcement of Car of the Year, the world's most prestigious new car award, a competition of which Autocar is a sponsor and yours truly is a juror. Now, what I really like about Car of the Year is that it does not take a bean from car manufacturers. There are no fancy dinners with tables at £1,000 a pop, and we do not charge manufacturers to use the logo. Simply, we invite car company Big Cheeses into a room at the start of the Geneva Motor Show and hand over the gong and a glass of champagne. Now, this year's winner is the Peugeot 208 Super Mini, which was announced in the same room at the very same time, just sort of broadcast online rather than to 500 people, which only begs the question, who gets all the champagne? Onwards then to the cars, and let's start with high excitement and early in the alphabetical order list with the Alfa Romeo Giulia GTA. Now, the Giulia Quadrifoglio is probably our favourite sports saloon of the past decade. In fact, it feels more like a sports car than a sports saloon. Well, the GTA is an even more extreme version of that. Its 2.9 litre engine has been recalibrated and given a titanium exhaust to lift power by 30 horsepower to 533 brake horsepower. Better though is that some 100 kilograms has been removed from the car's curb weight. Now that's partly thanks to a carbon fibre bonnet, roof, front bumper, wheel arches and drive shaft. The latter should also increase throttle response. But the rest of the weight loss is down to an extensive use of aluminium and composites elsewhere. There is a 50 millimetre wider track both front and rear with 20 inch centre lock wheels and an aero package incorporating a larger front splitter, a carbon fibre rear diffuser and a huge rear wing. There is even a track-focused variant called the GTA-M, which remains road legal but loses the rear seats and gains a rear roll cage, gets carbon fibre bucket race front seats and six-point harnesses. Think of this as Alpha's answer then to Jaguar's Project 8 or the BMW M4 GTS. Like those then, it will be expensive. Just 500 GTA and GTA Ms, we don't know what proportion of which there will be, will be produced and we think the price will start at at least £100,000. The Bentley Mulliner Bacalar is a £1.5 million two-seat luxury GT car of which Bentley will make just 12. And you can put the phone down, I'm afraid it has allocated all of them to customers already. This is a new departure for Bentley's Mulliner coach building division though, which will now launch an ultra-exclusive model as often as once every two years. This one is a two-seater, Bentley's first since the 1930s, heavily inspired by the EXP100 GT concept from last year. The interior references blower Bentleys from the late 1920s, Bentley says, with a heavily focused wraparound cockpit. They reckon it's something they couldn't reproduce in a full production car, and the only features carried over from production Bentleys are the door handles, because of the keyless go that comes with them, and the steering wheel cap, because there's an airbag behind it. Materials include wool and tweed from the Scottish borders, and get this, 5,000 year old riverwood sourced from the unglamorous location of peat bogs, or lakes and rivers, where these trees fell down rather a long time ago in the fens of East Anglia. That's in the east of England if you're overseas. The Bacalar uses Bentley's 6-litre W12 engine with 650 horsepower, which is 41 brake more than standard. Bentley says the Bacalar is a pilot project for Mulliner, which could make one or two cars in any given small series if a customer really wanted, but then the price would be much higher than this, while about 10 to 12 is the limit to what it'll put out in any one go. Dacia has strong form with introducing very cheap cars and has previewed its first electric vehicle with this, the Spring Electric concept, of which a production version will follow next year and become, Dacia thinks, the most affordable EV available in Europe. The Spring Electric's design is based heavily on the Renault City KZE electric crossover that Renault, Dacia's parent company, designed primarily for the Chinese market. Few technical details have been released, although Dacia says that the production version of the Spring Electric will have a range of more than 125 miles, underlining its intended use as an urban car. 
It's just 3.7 metres long, city car dimensions, and has five doors. As well as offering it for private sale, Dacia says the Spring Electric will be made available via car sharing services, which the Renault Group already has experience with, thanks to the Zoe, Kangoo ZE and Twizy. There's no word yet on whether it'll come to the UK, but the early focus will be on car sharing services, which have had limited take up in Britain so far. There is a new BAC Mono, the British single seat track supercar, which gets turbo power for the first time. It's powered by a Mountune developed 2.3 litre Ford four cylinder engine, making 330 horsepower, a 25 horsepower boost over the previous naturally aspirated unit. Torque though is up by almost 30% with more than 295 foot pounds now. Company bosses Neil and Ian Briggs reckon the new car should be four seconds a lap faster than the original around the Silverstone GP circuit. The official 0 to 60 mile an hour time is just 2.7 seconds and the car weighs only 570 kilos at the curb with lighter body panels and a series of other weight saving details that mean despite the extra weight of a turbo engine, the car is 10 kilograms lighter overall than it used to be. The Briggs brothers say the latest car has 40 3D printed components. Suspension is by double wishbones all round with adjustable Olin's dampers and there are specially homologated Pirelli Trofeo R tyres. BAC is taking orders now. The car is priced at £165,000 but deliveries won't start until 2021 because BAC has to finish building the Mono R specials it unveiled at Goodwood last summer. Audi has revealed the fourth generation A3 Sportback, its best-selling model in Europe, which it has tried to make look sportier to address the absence of a three-door this time around. It's nearly the same size as before at 4.3 metres long, but it is three centimetres wider. At launch, the engine lineup is a 1.5 litre petrol and two litre diesel, with one litre petrols and a mild hybrid 1.5 petrol to follow. Flagship S3 and RS3 models will arrive later this year. The S3 will have a 306 horsepower 2 litre turbo engine, while the RS3 will continue with a 5 cylinder petrol. Because there's no 3 door this time, there won't be an A3 Cabriolet, but Audi has got plans to introduce a higher riding A3 all road to take on the Mercedes GLA. The first of two Aston Martins then looks like a concept, but is actually this V12 Speedster, which is a limited run production car because like the McLaren Elva or the Ferrari Monza, and in fact, a bit like the Mercedes McMurk SLR Sterling Moss Edition, no supercar manufacturer would be seen without a limited run windscreenless hypercar these days. So there'll be just 88 of these Speedsters made and deliveries will start early next year, priced from 765,000 pounds or your local equivalent. Now the platform is a mix of DBS, Superleggera and Vantage underpinnings and lots of the body, well, all of the body, is carbon fibre. If it looks quite grey, that's because it's meant to look like an FA-18 Hornet jet combat aircraft. Now unlike an FA-18, this has a 5.2 litre twin turbocharged V12 engine making 690 horsepower or so in this form at about 555 pounds foot of torque. The 0 60 is claimed at around three and a half seconds and the top speed is governed at 186 miles an hour, although Bagsy not trying it without a crash helmet. And so to the second Aston Martin, the very much production Vantage Roadster, which the company hopes will boost slightly underwhelming number of Vantage sales. So think of it as a Porsche 911 Cabriolet rival. It's priced at £127,000, which is around £12,000 more than the Coupe, and the Coupe has just had its price reduced, incidentally. Now, the Roadster uses the same 4-litre Mercedes AMG V8 as the Coupe, making 503 brake horsepower. The roof mechanism adds 60 kilograms to the Vantage, which presumably gets a little bit floppier in the body at the same time. Now, deliveries will start in the second quarter of 2020. This is now getting pretty close to how next year's BMW i4 electric saloon will look. Based on the same underpinnings as the upcoming 4 Series Grand Coupe, the Concept i4 previews a production car that will arrive as a direct rival to Tesla's Model 3, offering as much as 523 horsepower and with a range of up to 373 miles if this concept is anything to go by. This concept has an electric motor underneath the bonnet driving all four wheels. Underneath sits an 80 kilowatt hour battery pack, though it's expected that the production car will run in rear wheel drive too and be available with smaller capacity batteries. Moving away from the radical design of BMW's first generation i models, the i3 and recently departed i8, the i4 has a largely more conventional four-door saloon body. 
Slightly weird though that BMW's biggest and, let's be kind, most controversial grill is appearing on a car that, being electric, doesn't need one at all. The Zinger Silent C is unusual. It's a partly 3D printed hypercar from California and the name 21C is because it is meant to be one of the 21st century's most advanced performance vehicles, or so it says here. To that end, it gets a one plus one seating configuration with a driver's seat, front row center and one passenger seat behind. Behind all that is a homegrown 2.88 litre naturally aspirated flat plane crank V8 that revs to, get this, 11,000 RPM. That sends its power to the rear wheels via a 7-speed sequential gearbox, but there is also a pair of electric motors at the front, taking the total power output to 1,233 brake horsepower. 1250 metric courses. That gives, Zinger says, a 1 to 1 power to weight ratio because in road form this car weighs 1250 kilos or in a track configuration just 1218 kilos. Unsurprisingly then claimed performance figures are quite startling. 0 to 62 in 1.9 seconds, 0 to 186 miles an hour in 15 seconds at a top speed of nearly 270 miles an hour and a probable seven figure price. The Koenigsegg Gamera is a surprise new model that the Swedish company describes as a Mega GT, which doesn't seem too unreasonable given it can seat four people and has 1700 horsepower. Like the brand's Yesco hypercar flagship, the Gamera gets its power from a high capacity electrified powertrain. There is a relatively small two litre three cylinder motor, although that makes 600 brake horsepower on its own, and that's mated to a number of electric motors, making the car four wheel drive and taking the overall power output to 1700 horsepower. It can operate in pure EV mode at up to 186 miles an hour and has a claimed electric range of 31 miles. While it can run on conventional petrol, it will also run on ethanol or methanol, which Koenigsegg says makes it at least as CO2 neutral as a pure electric car. The Gamera has been designed to be sold globally, so features a full airbag system, a suite of driver aids and what is claimed to be a rather solid central monocoque. Just 300 will be made, and while official pricing hasn't been confirmed, expect to pay more than a million pounds. Renault's Morphos, Morphos? Who knows? Is meant to do a few different things. Firstly, it is an outlandish concept car, which is meant to reflect the family car of 2027. But just as important, if not more so, is that it is based on the Renault Nissan Mitsubishi Alliance's new CMF EV platform which will be underneath Renault's first electric crossover when that turns up later this year. So on the concept front then, the Morphos can stretch itself by 400 millimetres slightly weirdly, which extends the wheelbase from 2.7 to 2.9 metres and the overall length from 4.4 to 4.8 metres, which increases rear seat volume and boot volume at the same time, which is something that would frankly be slightly silly in a production car. But what it's meant to get Renault and us used to is the fact that it might make smaller and larger batteries available in the same car. So in the Morphos's city form, for example, it has a 40 kilowatt hour battery and a range of 249 miles. Renault reckons you could stop somewhere, fit an extra 50 kilowatt hour battery, it won't happen in reality, I don't think, and that would increase the range to more than 400 miles. Now what's more relevant then is that this platform's skateboard style layout is flexible enough to do both of those things and lets the wheels be pushed towards the corners of the car to maximise interior space and the fact that the batteries are sit very low under the floor gives a low centre of gravity to improve the handling characteristics. Now anyway, this looks quite cool for now. Let's see how the electric crossover, if a real, looks when it turns up later this year. McLaren's new Super Series flagship is the 765 LT, the company's fourth long tail model and a lighter and faster version of the 720S it launched three years ago. McLaren has found some 80 kilos to remove from the 720S's curb weight, leaving it at a quoted 1,229 kilograms. McLaren's engineers admit that this was their biggest headache, given the 720S is already the lightest car in its class. Some 22 kilos were saved by switching wheels, race seats have saved 18 kilos and deleting the aircon, which I imagine all customers will ask not to delete after all, saves 10 kilos. Lighter body panels save 14 kilograms. Power is up from 710 brake horsepower, the 720 PS that gives the regular car its name, to 754 brake horsepower, 765 PS, thanks to tweaks to the familiar 4 litre twin turbocharged V8 engine. That gets stronger, lighter forged aluminium pistons, a three layer head gasket from the McLaren Senna, a higher flow fuel system and a lower back pressure exhaust. 
McLaren now quotes a 0 to 62 mile an hour acceleration time of 2.8 seconds with a 0 to 125 mile an hour time, that's about 200 kilometers now, of 7.2 seconds. McLaren says the car's lap time at an undisclosed reference track, which could be done for because it does test there a lot, is 2.5 seconds quicker than a 720S, although without knowing exactly where that is, it's not a terribly useful benchmark. And while you'll see that in appearance it is a 720S at heart, there are new aerodynamic addenda aimed at boosting downforce and high-speed stability, made from carbon fibre sourced from McLaren's new composite factory in Sheffield. The name long tail is only just appropriate. The 765 LT is just 10 millimeters longer in the rear than a regular 720S, with the rest of the 50 millimeter length gain coming from a more effective front splitter. There are new brakes, tires, and revised suspension with lighter springs. McLaren will aim to sell 765 of these with a price as yet undisclosed, but for the record, the 720S is around 210,000 pounds in the UK. This rather handsome thing is the Hyundai Prophecy concept, which shows us what to expect from the next generation of electric Hyundais. Said to have been designed with a focus on aerodynamic efficiency, the Prophecy has a clean body with minimal bodywork creases with a neat integrated rear spoiler to minimise lift at speed. Technical details remain largely under wraps, which is better than making outlandish claims, but we do know the Prophecy is based on a new EV architecture. As with Hyundai's Kona Electric, the battery pack is housed under the floor, hence the air intake under the front bumper, while several new design features that will migrate to production cars include pixelated front and rear light clusters in what Hyundai says will become a signature design element. Being a concept, the Prophecy has been allowed to be a bit outlandish inside. It's prepped for autonomy that's quite a long way away in real terms, so it has joysticks either side of the driver's seat in an otherwise rather tasteful interior. Hyundai's sibling brand Kia recently revealed it was working on a high-performance EV based on its imagined concept, suggesting Hyundai could have similar intentions. Here's hoping. Porsche's range-topping 911 model, the Turbo S, has returned. The 992 Series 911 has been re-engineered with what's being described as a completely new flat-six engine, although it is still a 3.8-litre unit. Power is up by 69 brake horsepower over the previous 911 Turbo and now sits at 641 horsepower, while the car makes 590 pounds foot between 2500 and 4500 RPM. Performance then is rather brisk. The Turbo S has a 0 to 62 mile an hour time of 2.7 seconds and a top speed of 205 miles an hour. Although Porsche claims the most noticeable difference is the way the car gets from rest to 120 miles an hour, which takes an entire second less than it used to. As well as being more powerful than ever, the 911 Turbo is though wider than ever. Its width is up by 20 millimetres to 1900 millimetres, although that's still compact by supercar standards. And that's to accommodate a 42 millimetre wider front and 10 millimetre wider rear track. Inside, it feels very much like other 992 series 911s. Porsche hasn't yet announced UK prices, but in Germany, the coupe costs the equivalent of £155,000 with the Turbo S Cabriolet and other £10,000 on top of that. DS has revealed an executive saloon car which has the Audi A4 firmly in its sights. The DS9 sits on PSA Group's EMP2 platform, which means it's closely related to the Peugeot 508 to you and me. And like that, it will have an internally combusted engine or be available as a plug-in hybrid. So the range topper will have some 355 horsepower because it will have a 1.6 litre turbo at the front with electrification and also electric for the back axle. New to DS2 though, is that there will be a front wheel drive plug-in hybrid which has a 222 brake horsepower, 1.6 litre engine and electric motor at the front and does without the electrification at the rear. It will have an electric only range of about 31 miles, courtesy of an 11.9 kilowatt hour battery and there'll be pure petrol versions as well, but no diesel. The DS9 will be built exclusively in China, which is where it is expected to take the majority of its sales. Now, it will be exported to Europe from there, with delivery starting early next year. Prices will start at around £30,000, and the DS9 will be tasked with doing something that big French saloon cars don't always have great history with, which is competing with premium German rivals. The Bugatti Chiron Pure Sport is a slower Bugatti. Whereas the recent Chiron Supersport 300 Plus was a road car that could do 300 miles an hour, this new Pure Sport is a Bugatti tuned to be fun at lower speeds. 
To improve the Chiron's agility and handling, Bugatti has cut 50 kilograms from the Chiron's near two-ton curb weight, 16 kilos of which has come from the wheels alone. A new set of aerodynamic addenda, including a 1.9 meter wide rear wing, boost downforce, and there is a new tire compound and structure to boost lateral grip by 10%. Springs are 65% firmer at the front and 33% firmer at the rear, with a new tuning for the adaptive dampers, new camber settings, and new carbon fiber anti-roll bars, which give flatter, more responsive cornering. A new Sport Plus driving mode slackens off the stability control program too. The Chiron Pure Sport's 8-litre W16 engine retains its 1,500 metric horsepower output, but the rev limit has been increased by 200 RPM to 6,900 RPM, and the gear ratios have been revised to downwards so that the Chiron is running flat out at a paltry 217 miles an hour. As a result of the tweaks, the Chiron Pure Sport has much better in-gear acceleration, as if it was rubbish already. In all, some 60 of the 500 Chirons that'll be built will be these Pure Sport models, with production starting in the second half of this year. Bugatti is refreshingly transparent about the price, which is 3 million euros plus VAT. The Polestar Precept is an electric four-door Grand Tourer that previews the design of future Polestar models. That's important because the brand is trying to establish an identity as a standalone manufacturer rather than one tied to Volvo, its parent company, because the Polestar 1 looks quite a lot like a Volvo. The Polestar 1 will be followed imaginatively by the 2 and 3, and while the 1 and 2 were heavily guided by Volvo design, the Precept is meant to demonstrate how the forthcoming 3 will look. The Precept is quite a long car, 15 centimetres longer than Tesla Model S. There are a whole bunch of recycled materials inside, such as seat upholstery 3D knitted from recycled plastic bottles and carpets made from reclaimed fishing nets, which, let's hope, are all a little bit more comfortable than they sound. There's a next generation infotainment system powered by Android and building on Polestar's partnership with Google. So it has a 15 inch central touchscreen and a 12 inch instrument pack. When the Polestar 3 does arrive, it'll be a low and aerodynamic coupe-ish SUV, which we're expecting to land in 2022. Morgan has launched a completely revised Plus 4, the second of a new generation of BMW-powered models. With a bonded aluminium chassis as first seen on the Plus 6 last year, the Plus 4 replaces the old 44, Plus 4 and Roadster models and is likely to account for around half of Morgan's annual volume, which is 900 cars a year. Prices for a manual start at £63,000 with an 8-speed auto and additional £1,500. Despite very similar looks to the outgoing car, which is part of the appeal really, Morgan says that under the skin only 3% of parts are carried over. Traditionalists shouldn't worry, the body is still largely hand-beaten and that sits on an ash body frame and there is a hand-trimmed leather interior. The engine is a BMW turbo four-cylinder making 255 horsepower and given the plus four weighs a modest 1,009 kilos, it can hit 60 miles an hour in 4.8 seconds and go on to nearly 150 miles an hour. So thank you for joining us from the Not 2020 Geneva Motor Show. We're here on video all the time. We're at autocar.co.uk all the time, and we're on All Good News Agents every Wednesday. So join us again for more news, reviews, so on and so forth. And we will be back from a real motor show later on in the year.